Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us clap hands for the worship team and appreciate them. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. We thank the Lord. He's a wonderful God. What a privilege just to be in worship. Hallelujah. My God. I just want to... You know, um, these guys are, are, are very anointed. Amen. Um, I'm just thinking... They, 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 they don't sound live. It's, they, they sound like this thing has been edited somewhere. You know, and let's, 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 let's appreciate them again, you know. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sounds like it's been mastered somewhere in studio. Praise God. And uh, we, we, we thank God, you know. And yes, angels join us as we worship and and we appreciate uh, you guys. Your voices are, are angelic. We, we thank God for you. Praise God. Um, I would like us just to uh, talk today about the 40-day experience of a believer. And that's what we are going to be looking at today. The 40-day experience that every believer must have. Um, I want you to know that um, when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, depth is expected, praise God. You must deepen your roots in him. Don't allow yourself to remain superficial. There must be commitment. Someone used use a strong language and say, don't, don't, don't be in a situation where you treat God like your sidekick, you know. Um, there must be commitment. Praise God. Don't have a casual relationship with God, you know. And I do believe that you will never appreciate the power of salvation if you don't deepen your roots in him. And I do believe that uh, this 40-day experience that uh, we're going to be looking at in scripture, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an invitation to all of us, beloved. You must have your 40 day experience with God. So that wherever you go, you know that you know that you know that you know that Jesus is Lord. It's very important. Wherever you, you see, many, are, many of us, we struggle in the area of worship or in, in the area of commitment because the truth is we have never been intimate with God. Where intimacy is experience. I want you to understand that it's going to be hard for you to walk away from the faith where there is intimacy. And that is the invitation that I'm extended to you regarding this 40-day experience. First of all, when we talk about the 40-day experience, we're looking at the life of Moses, 40 days on Mount Sinai, just basking in the presence of God. When we talk about this 40-day experience, we're looking at the life of Elijah when he was on Mount Horeb. Again, basking in the presence of God. And God was just downloading things into his heart. So that wherever he went, Elijah will never be the same again. And I want you to also appreciate something. It's not just all these powerful prophets that had this experience. Even Jesus himself. Now that really uh, uh, made me ask a, a lot of questions. If Jesus needed a 40-day experience in the presence of the Father, how shall we escape in this journey of faith without our 40-day experience? If Jesus needed it as a human being, you need it too, beloved. And I want you to appreciate that this 40-day experience is not man-orchestrated, but it is God-ordained. Very important. It is not man orchestrated, but it is God ordained. Elijah did not invite himself to Mount Horeb, but he was invited by God. Moses did not invite himself to Mount Sinai, but he was invited by God. It is not something that is born out of your zeal for God. 
but you come per invitation so that though no carnality can have a share in it. Flesh should not initiate this. As a matter of fact, you, you will realize that even Jesus, when you look at Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says Jesus was led by the Spirit to the wilderness. By the Spirit. So in other words, he did not just wake up one day and decide, you know what, I just want to have good times in God, you know. And then he went to the wilderness. The Bible is clear. He was led by the Spirit of God to the wilderness. When you try to orchestrate the 40-day experience in your own strength, it could kill you. Recently, <laughs> we read on the newspaper about a, a Zimbabwean young man who was fasting for 40 days and he died. And I can guarantee you that if you come per invitation, you will not die in his presence. No. You will not die. And obviously, the flesh was driving this young man because he was actually praying for a Lamborghini for 40 days. Forty days of prayer and fasting for a Lamborghini. And he died. And many years ago, I read on the newspaper about a pastor in Swaziland who also wanted to embark on a 40-day fast. And the idea was to beat the record of Jesus. Twenty-one days later, he was a dead man. He died. Because you cannot do these things in your carnality. You come per invitation. That is why I will even, again, with the authority of scriptures, I can tell you that if you embark on such a huge undertaking as a 40-day fast, it must be spirit-inspired. It must be spirit-inspired. As a matter of fact, even if you don't die, you can do a 40-day fast and come out with nothing. As long as it is driven by flesh, as long as you are wanting to tick a box, done that, been there, as long as you want us to fear you, that you've been, you know there are people who when they fast and, and, and they come down from the mountain, we must all bow down to them, you know, hey, he's been to the mountain, this one, you know. We don't do that. Hallelujah. It is a divine orchestration. Let me add something to this. In your 40 day experience, you may not even be led to fast. Are you hearing me? So when we talk about a 40 day experience, we are talking about you basking in the presence of God. With or without a fast. Let me emphasize that. With or without a fast. It's quite interesting that when Elijah was led to his 40-day experience, the Bible tells us that the angel of the Lord prepared food for him and something to drink, and that food sustained him for 40 days, supernatural food. He was divinely sustained for 40 days so that he could not hunger while basking in the presence of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Moses literally was transfigured on Mount Sinai so that there was no room for food. <laughs> and that is why he was saying you cannot pull this off in your natural strength. Praise the name of Jesus. So this is very important, but you must undergo this experience. With or without fasting, you must go through this experience where you, without your pastor, without your home cell leader, will have an encounter with God so that you get to know him better. Praise the name of Jesus. And I want us to look at the example of Moses with regards to this. When Moses went up the mountain, this is found in Exodus chapter 24, when you, when you read verses 15 to 18, that's the story. Moses goes up to the mountain, 24 verses 15 to 18. The first six days, he was just covered in a cloud, no conversation. Please note that. No conversation, he was just covered in a cloud. In other words, this was a time for Moses to disappear in God 
before there is a conversation. I want you to be obliterated in me. You must die in me so that Christ, the hope of glory, may rise up. So Moses had to undergo a process of disappearance so that the glory of God will rise up in him. And then God will have a conversation with himself in Moses. I hope, I hope you are tracking with me. And that's the desire that you must have so that you die completely so that when you and God are having conversation, it's like God and God is having conversation. Amen. That is why in the book of Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in Jesus Christ, who died for me and gave himself for me. Praise the name of Jesus. I've been crucified. I no longer exist. But Jesus, the hope of glory, resists. So when heaven converses with me, it's like heaven is talking to heaven. So Moses needed that six days just to be obliterated, to completely disappear in God's presence. That is why later on when he went down the mountain, it was like God had appeared among the nations, among the people of Israel. That's the desire. I don't know about you, beloved. You see, the, the reason why many of us, again, we end up doing funny things, you know. We, we do funny things. We consult here and there. It's because we are trying to get what we can only get from the mountaintop. That's the invitation. Now, this is what you do. This invitation requires your hunger and thirst for God. That's all that is required. You must be hungry and you must be thirsty. And I can guarantee you, if you hunger for God, if you are thirsty for God, an invitation will be extended. Come up hither. Keep saying to you that God cannot impose himself on you. God cannot pu push his glory down your throat. You have to say, Lord, I am hungry for you. Just like a deer pants for the water, my soul thirsts for you, O oh God. Hallelujah. And you, you, you are a generation that is very challenged because there are many things that are competing for your attention. You have too many choices. You have too many choices. You are spoiled for choice. And that is why... For you as a generation, it's going to take an extra effort to say, Lord, I hunger for you. In the midst of entertainment, in the midst of social media, in the midst of all that's going on around me. But Lord, I dissociate myself from all of this. But I hunger for you. I thirst for you. Hallelujah. At least they did not have to worry about Facebook. They did not even have libraries where they could go to. To kill time. There were no movie houses that they could go to to kill time. But you as a generation, my word, you have to understand that you are a people within a people. You are not of this world. Praise the name of Jesus. I'm going to the mountain. Praise the name of Jesus. Lord, I'm coming. I'm coming to you. Hallelujah. And then... <laughs> I want us to see something when Moses was spending time in God's presence as we read here for 40 days. Wonderful things were happening. Number one, Moses got to know who God is. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing that you can know God that is written about scripture. But there is also another dimension of God that is written about in scripture. And this is the dimension of personal, personal encounter. Many people are moving with logos, but there is no revelational knowledge. And you must move from logos to revelational knowledge so that whatever you have been reading about in scripture is now revealed to you. Hallelujah. Revelation. Revelation. That actually, that's why the Bible says, my people perish for lack of revelation. Not that they don't have the written word. Not that they don't have logos, but they don't have revelation. And that is why we're saying, come up hither, come up hither. There is a place near me, God says. There is a place near me. You're, you've got to come up to that place. 
so that you do not just have heard knowledge because during times of trials and tribulation heard knowledge will not sustain you you need something extra and that is an encounter with god praise the name of jesus you see when job says i know my redeemer liveth that is a man who is filled with more than just logos that's a man who has had a revelation even though I have festering wounds in my body, even though I have sores boils all over me, but I will not forsake him. My wife is telling me to reject God. My wife is telling me to curse God, but I will not do it. My sons and daughters are dead, but I will not do it. I've lost my millions. All my businesses are dead, but I will not do it. Why? I know my Redeemer liveth. It's revelation, you see. It's revelation. It's revelation. You cannot have stubborn faith without revelation. Audacious faith requires that things be revealed to you. It cannot be Pastor Lamuga says, no, 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 no. What are you saying based on your encounter with God? Are, are you hearing me, beloved? This is an invitation to that place. So Moses, 40 days, he's spending time on the mountain top with God and he is exploring the dimensions of God. Just to summarize, he had to learn about who God is. He had to learn about true worship, true worship. That is why he's given 10 commandments. He's even given moral laws and ceremonial laws about worship in the context of the old covenant. Because you see, worship is not just a song. Worship is a lifestyle. So that is why he needed moral laws in order to articulate holiness in the context of what God was instructing. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And, and let me just add, we, we, we don't worship God based on our discrepancy. Are you hearing me? So they need, he needed to be in that 40 day experience so that he will not worship God presumptuously. Worship should never be left at our discretion. I keep saying that. Praise the name of Jesus. But we worship per instruction. Instruction. Hallelujah. Because when worship is left at our discretion, there is chaos. Everybody does as they deem fit and there is chaos. Hallelujah. So Moses receives these instructions. He even receives instructions about how to build the tabernacle. Hallelujah. So that the building of the tabernacle will not be just a, 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 an imagination of a powerful architect. The building of the tabernacle had to be in accordance with the blueprint from heaven. Hallelujah. So that again, he gets instructions about the silver and gold that the nation of Israel were carrying. Because that silver and gold was supposed to be used in the tabernacle. That silver and gold was supposed to be used in the building of ministry materials, you know, ministry items and worship items. Hallelujah. So all of these, he even get, he, he gets from God sketches about uh, the, the, the balls in, have, in, in the tabernacle, even the utensils, everything, the table, the ark of the covenant, the shape and everything. How much gold was needed, how much silver, how much bronze was needed. He even gets, he gets designs about the, 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 the curtains, even the pillars, everything. These are designs that God is downloading because God does not leave anything to chance, even regarding your ministry. You should not do ministry out of zeal without a blueprint from God. Please understand that. We are in a season when a lot of ministries are failing because they are nothing but a product of men's thinking. Somebody has not had a 40-day experience with God. We are driven by zeal and, and, and enthusiasm without divine inspiration. Even ministry. Even ministry, God has a lot to say about how you do your ministry. Praise God. Hallelujah. That is why sometimes we tremble. Even at naming ministries after our own names. Sometimes we struggle with it. Because the blueprints that we receive 
have nothing about us in them. <laughs> are, are, you, are you tracking with me? Everything that God says has nothing to do with Sboniso, but it has everything to do with him. Praise the name of Jesus. So, beloved, I want you to understand that uh, th this is a season. Actually, I can assure you that God is bringing the church into this 40-day experience. But you, cannot on, you, you can only partake of this experience if you're hungry for him. Another man is Elijah. Elijah. So, Elijah, he's very distraught because there's a lot of apostasy in the nation of Israel. Jezebel is running after him and he wants his head. And then uh, he gets into this place where he's very discouraged. And then God encourages him. He sends an angel. The angel gives him food. And, and then God says to him, go to a mountain, I will show you. Praise the name of Jesus. And I want, you to, I want us to learn, this is in the book of 1 Kings chapter 19. If you read verses 15 to 18. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the first experience that Elijah had was to learn to distinguish between drama and God's presence. That, that's the first lesson that Elijah had to learn. That there is a difference between drama and God's presence. There was a drama of the earthquake. And the Bible says God was not in the earthquake. There was a drama of a heavy wind that mighty rushing wind was not a representation of God's presence. There was a drama of fire. And then God was not in the fire. But then this man of God, after all, he has even called fire from heaven at some point. And I'm sure he must have thought to himself, this, this huge fire, this must be God. But the Bible says God was not in the fire. But now I want you to see something, beloved, there was then a gentle whisper. And then the Bible says, and God spoke. Not in the fire, not in the mighty rushing wind, not in the earthquake, but he spoke in a gentle whisper. So the man of God had to learn that I have to discern the presence of God. I cannot use my experiential knowledge that he moves through the fire. He moves like a mighty rushing wind. He moves as in shaking things. Yes, even in his word he says, I will shake the heavens and the earth. He shakes things, but not every shaking is from God. He is the consuming fire, but not every fire is a representation of him. He can move like a gushing mighty wind, but not every heavy wind is him discerning God's presence. Now church, this is going to be important for you because we are on the verge of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We have to discern the presence of God. Hallelujah. You see, when there is an outpouring of the Holy Ghost, when the church is having a Pentecostal experience, you have to know what the presence of God smells like, how it looks like, how it feels like. You have to know. You have to know. You cannot embrace every showmanship. As God's presence. Hallelujah. Can I just tell you something? Never assume that when there is a revival, the devil stays very far. <laughs> Let me shock you. The devil loves revivals. He loves revivals. That is why sometimes you wonder, God could be moving, doing powerful things, but all of a sudden, Carnality just creeps in. While God is moving, carnality just creeps in. And you wonder, what's going on? Because the devil, even in the midst of a revival, the devil is always waiting on the fringes, looking for an opportunity to throw some of his stuff in the mix. So that those of us who are not discerning will think God is moving when God is not moving. So that is why we go up the mountain. We come into this 40-day experience so that we can know what the presence of God looks like. In the book of 1 John, chapter 4, verse 1, the Bible says you must test every spirit. Test every spirit. The modern day church is very low on discernment. We are very low on discernment. That is why false prophets are doing much better in the church than true prophets. 
Why is it that we are very quick to reject the true word of God, but when the false prophets are in the midst of us, we are always excited? Bring a false prophet here. Believe me, all of us will be in our, on our feet. All of us will be on our feet. Because many of us are not discerning. And I want us to understand that God is going to be exposing all this falsehood in this season. Why? Because judgment begins in the house of the Lord. Yes? Judgment begins in the house of the Lord. And I want you to therefore just do yourself a favor. Have this 40-day experience where you learn to descend the presence of God. Matthew 24 verse 24, the Bible says, Jesus says, the deception would be so intense in the last days if it was possible, even the elect will be deceived. So much so that Jesus says those days will have to be shortened because no one will be left standing. Hmm. This is powerful. Think of it. In other words, if false prophecy was to run its full cause, none of us will remain standing. God has to shorten the days of falsehood. He has to shorten the days of lawlessness so that we can survive. The best of us. When the enemy has cooked up his things, the best of us can be confused for a moment. Hallelujah. So that is why. But still, you have the spirit of God within you. There is an anointing within you that will be able to tell the spirit of falsehood from that which is true. Hallelujah. So come up the mountain. Come up the mountain. So that is why I say, just stop chasing after Mickey Mouse activities. Go deeper. Go deeper. Hallelujah. Go deeper. Without your homestead leader, without your pastor, just in your own personal capacity, for your own sake, because we don't know where you're going to end up. You might end up in New York where there will be no homestead leader. You might have probably to go to, to, to Australia where you probably spend three months looking for a church. In that three months, nothing, nothing of your faith must be lost. Why? Because you have gone deeper. Praise the name of Jesus. Even if you end up in a city where there is no Bible-based church, you have gone so deep in Jesus Christ. In a dry and weary land, you are immovable, unshakable in your faith. That is the creed we're looking for. Praise the name of Jesus. So, I want us to move back, uh, to, to move on. Uh, 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 in, in the story of Elijah, towards the end of his 40-day experience, he's given an instruction by God. Go anoint Hazael. Anoint Jehu. Anoint Elisha. So that whoever escape the sword of Elijah will not escape the sword of Hazael. Whoever escapes the sword of Hazael will not escape the sword of Jehu. Whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, he will not escape the sword of Elisha. That is a generational connection. Praise the name of Jesus. I think Nondo spoke about this young generation. The things that we see sometimes discourage us. Are you aware that we are the generation that is supposed to pull this generation by the hand and say, listen, let's walk together. Let's walk together. All the Jezebels that I could not kill, you must kill. Praise the name of Jesus. Do you know that there are, there are strongholds in the, in, in the kingdom of God? The, the, in the realm of the spirit, there are strongholds that will take more than one generation to uproot. Je Jezebel was a very stubborn evil spirit. This is an evil spirit that took more than one generation to overcome. It's quite interesting. Elijah was long dead when Jezebel was killed. But here is the wisdom of Elijah. When he was on the mountaintop, Mount Horeb, with God, he heeded the instruction. Listen, you might not have been able to kill Jezebel, but there is a generation that will come after you, that will kill Jezebel. So anoint Hazael. Anoint, listen, the question that you should be asking yourself right now, who is mentoring me and who am I mentoring? Because we cannot be operating in silos. And there should be no divide between the younger generation and the older generation. Please, drag your children to Bible studies. Yes. Drag your children to prayer meetings. Because they must learn the art of war. 
Praise the name of Jesus. When you do your family devotions, even when your children are sleeping, wake them up. Wake them up so that they learn the art of war. You should not die with all the spiritual expertise with you. Pass them to the next generation. Otherwise, they will not be able to kill the Jezebels that you could not kill. This is a generational blessing. And that is why you need to come up the mountain. And God, when you are on this mountain, this 40-day experience, God will tell you even specifically who you ought to walk with. He's very specific. These are men that I want you to anoint. It's Haziel. In case you know too many Haziels, this is Haziel from Damascus. You must anoint this specific man called Jehu. In case you know too many Jehu, this one, this Jehu I'm talking about, is the son of Nimshi. Anoint him. I know you lead the school of the prophets. I, run, I know you run a prophetic school, Elijah. But there is a man called Elisha. Anoint him. In case there are many Elishas in your school of prophets, this one, is the son of Shaphat. Anoint him. Praise the name of Jesus. Why? Because God wants to ensure that Jezebel is defeated. Hallelujah. Listen. God is raising a generation that will decisively deal with everything that we could not deal with as a generation. So that is why we, we cannot afford to allow our children to drop the ball, beloved. Raise prayer warriors. Raise prayer warriors out of your children. We want to see, before you die, make sure that your children, you have seen at least your children going around, going, they must do it while you are alive. They must do it. Let them walk in the anointing. Let them walk in the grace of God. Let them walk in the power of the Holy Ghost while you are alive. I believe that Elijah died a very satisfied man. Because every time he looked at Jehu, Haziel, every time he looked at, El at Elisha, he knew that, you know what? There is hope for the next generation. The sad story is found in the book of Judges chapter 2 verse 10. In the book of Judges chapter 2 verse 10, the Bible says the generation that had seen the miracles of God was gone. And the generation that came after that had not seen the miracles of God decided to depart from the ways of God. This is after the death of Joshua. There was no generational passing of the baton. As a result, Israel came into a place of apostasy. Why? Because there was a break up. There was a disconnect generationally. Listen. Whatever you know about God, pass it to the next generation. Hallelujah. That is why one, one thing I appreciate about this local assembly. You know, we, we don't have a situation where, and I pray that this continues. The youth must be comfortable in our presence. Hallelujah. The youth must be comfortable in our presence. And I want you to understand that just because you are anointed, it does not mean that you must be this powerful man or woman of God who is untouchable. You know? No, no, that's not the anointing. The reason why Jesus was able to pass on everything to his disciples is because he was approachable. Jesus was easy to interact with. And I pray for anointed men and women that are easy to interact with. Because look, if you, are, if you scare us, how are we going to receive from you? And I want us to get, I know many of us come from different ministries. But in this ministry, there is something new that I want you to learn. We don't have dignitaries here. We don't have dignitaries. That is why you will not see me walking with bodyguards. You know, when, when, you see, when you see Ricardo around me or Tabiso around me, please don't think they are my bodyguards. <laughs> Don't think they're my bodyguards. You know, sometimes when you're walking with Tabiso and you're walking with Ricardo, and <laughs> people think, what's going on here, Pastor? And so, sometimes I have to kind of hold my steps and let them walk in front so that people don't get confused, you know. We, 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 don't, have, we don't have people who are unapproachable. 
Because we want to download everything that we know. One of my greatest joys is to spend time with young people and tell them everything I know about God. That is why I love Thursday Bible studies. I got to offload everything that God has been teaching me so that when I'm gone, nobody will say the pastor never told us. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Let's do this for the sake of the next generation. I want to repeat this. There are spiritual battles that will take more than one generation to win. So any generation that does not raise up the next generation is doing a great disservice to the kingdom. Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, we have a cloud of witnesses. Hallelujah. We have a cloud of witnesses. You know why we have this, uh, this chapter 12? The reason why we have a cloud of witnesses is because they are looking on to us. They are saying, that which you have started, that which we started, finish it. That which we started, finish it. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. That is why they say, go on, go on. You can do this. You can do this. Hallelujah. They are standing on the pavilions of heaven saying, listen, do this and do it well. Praise the name of Jesus. Who are you mentoring? Who is mentoring you? Listen, you have a responsibility to find a mentor. And you have a responsibility to find a mentee. Amen. Don't just wait. Don't just, don't just wait. And you've got to trouble somebody. Please teach me how to fight. I want my hands to be strong for battle. Praise the name of Jesus. I want my feet to be strong so that I can run on record places and do kingdom business. Hallelujah. Another thing, when, Elisha, when Elijah is on the mountain, God says to him, don't think you are the only one who is walking in holiness. Have you ever felt so lonely in this journey of faith? Listen, I can tell you that even as a pastor, there are pastoral meetings where I feel like I don't fit in here. Because all of us are pastors, but we don't seem to be speaking the same language. And it feels very lonely. With men of God, you feel lonely. Because here is the stark reality of what we are faced with. Not everyone who says Lord and Lord, 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 is really part of the kingdom. Unfortunately, we have a situation in the body of Christ where there are wolves that are covered in sheep clothing. Sometimes you have to be very discreet even in your relationships. You can't just say just because he's a preacher, you close your eyes and then you just dive into that relationship. No, no. We walk circumspectly. As Babu Pega said one time, we, we walk circumspectly. We need to be discreet. The Bible says a righteous man is discreet in friendships. And then Paul will say, hey, be careful, don't be misled. Bad company, including the company within the house of the Lord, will corrupt a good character. This is the situation that Elijah was in. He thought, you know what? Why am I so alone? Jezebel is running after me. It seems like no one wants to take my side. And then God says, listen, there is 7,000 more people who have not bowed a knee to Baal. You are not the only one. Please, I want to assure you this morning, you are not the only one. Praise God. Just turn to your neighbor and encourage them. Say, you are not the only one. You're not the only one. You see, there are many people in South America, in Russia, in Europe, who have not bowed a knee to the God of this world. Praise the name of Jesus. Believe me, they exist. They are there. I've got good news. When we go up the mountain to spend our 40-day experience in the presence of God, God will open our eyes to them. You are going to connect with people from across the ocean. Who will say, you know what? There is something about you. Even your post on Facebook, they are unique. Praise the name of Jesus. Even when you are posting on Instagram, while others are posting things about where they've been, where, what they do, all the things, all the material things, there is something about you. Hallelujah. God will connect us to the 7,000. He will. So that you are assured that you are not alone. 
there is a remnant that God is raising. Hallelujah. There is a remnant, not just in South Africa, not just in Devon. There is a remnant all over, all over the continent, all over the world. And God will connect. As a matter of fact, I, I have a dream of a remnant coming together. Praise the name of Jesus. Just before the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, when there is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, I once had a dream. There were people praying, people from different cultures, from all races. There were stadia along the coast, and people were praying. I will see people drop their bags in their homes. They will go to a prayer meeting that will last the whole day. People were just saying, Jesus, manifest your presence. Manifest your glory in our generation. The whole Absa Stadium was filled up. Praise the name of Jesus. And I saw many stadia along the coast, even to the south coast, people praying from every race, from every culture. Because God is connecting the remnant. God is connecting the remnant. Hallelujah. You are not alone. Just hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I know that sometimes the truth is not palatable to this generation, but there is a remnant that is hungry for the truth. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Elijah wanted to die because he thought he was alone. Please don't wish you will exit. Sikona. 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 Malbonka Malengos. And let's rush to Jesus. Jesus. I love Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. Again, as we said, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says he was led by the Spirit to the wilderness. But my main interest is from verses 8 to 11. I love verses 8 to 11. This is the last temptation that Jesus faces. The enemy takes him to the highest point, highest mountain. He says, do you see the splendor of all these kingdoms? And then the enemy says to Jesus, they belong to me. But I can give you all of them if you'll bow down and worship me. Can I just say this to you? Every believer will have a moment when you will have to strike a deal with the devil. Don't lose that. All of us, because you are not greater than Jesus, your master. There is no student that is greater than his teacher. There is no servant that is greater than his master. If they tempted Jesus in the area of material things and finances, they will tempt you. These days you have things popping up even on, on the internet. I was showing my sister Skulile that look, even the Illuminati are advertising on the internet. They say, even during this time of the pandemic, when people have lost their jobs, people have lost their businesses, you can join our organization. You will be taken care of financially instantly. I was asking myself the other day, how many believers have taken up on that offer? This is free money. There was a man who was testifying. That video was circulating. It was an audio that was circulating. This man said, I joined this group money keeps coming but i can't sleep at night money keeps coming but i can't sleep at night i feel like i'm losing my soul he says sometimes i leave my body i can see that's my body on the bed and i do horrific evil things in the spirit while my body is lying in my bedroom and he says, I'm going mad. This guy calls a radio station, a talk show, a Christian a, a, a radio program. He says, I need help. Can someone please pray for me? Joined on the internet. He's a believer. Joined on the internet just to resolve his financial problems. Beloved, can I just say it may not happen via the internet to you. But there is a mountain that the enemy is going to take you to. On that mountain, you will have to decide whether you get into the deal with him or not. Sadly, there are many believers who have come into that place where they break a deal with the enemy. You enter into this deal with the enemy, even for your ministry to do well. Even for your church to have resources. That is why even regarding this building fund, we, we are not desperate, beloved. We, we are not desperate to the point that we will take every offer from the enemy. No, no. We will rather stay in this hot chroma deck structure 
will rather boil her than to be in an air-conditioned, beautiful sanctuary that is sponsored by the kingdom of darkness. No, it will not happen. A pastor in America was giving a testimony. And this pastor said, I got a phone call from certain people. And these people said, listen, pastor, we have one million U.S. dollars. We want to give this money to you. And uh, you keep the certain po a certain portion of it. You bank it. They even told him where to invest it. And then uh, 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 we, we keep the certain portion of it. And then we will just... So basically, there's a certain percentage for the church, a certain percentage for us. And that kept going. That, 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 that is supposed to happen periodically. And then the pastor said, can I go pray about it? He went to pray about it. And then um, later on, he says, no. I can't do this. The Holy Spirit says, no. And then they kept pestering him, saying, listen, listen. We will give you this one million dollars. Just, we'll keep a small percentage. Go invest the rest. You know, and, and do whatever you want with your ministry. He says, I needed the money, but the Spirit of the Lord said no. And then, a month later, three FBI agents came to his office. And they said, Pastor, Congratulations. We've been testing you. In this city, there is a cabal of pastors who are taking money from drug lords. And these drug lords are doing money laundering through the church. And then the FBI agent said, we have been going around testing. You are the first one to say no. Because we are carrying out an investigation as to who are the corrupt pastors in this city. You are the first one to say no. Listen, beloved. You will be tested. You will have your moment of testing. Here's the thing. Pass the test. Pass the test. Praise the name of Jesus. You must pass. Listen, when you say no to the offers of the enemy, you will never be stranded on the street. Many of us are, are struggling to say no to the offers of the enemy because we think to ourselves, that is the end of me. No, 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 it's not. I love the story. When you read verse 11, the Bible says after, the, after Jesus had resisted the enemy, the devil fled from him. Listen, listen, listen. I don't know about you. I don't want to have Satan in my company. I don't want to have Satan having a hook on me that gives him freedom to frequently come to me. No, I don't want that. I don't want. And the best way you can set him to flight, resist temptation. Resist temptation. And the Bible says he fled from him. And that's what the scripture says. Resist temptation so that the devil can flee from you. So Satan left. Satan left. Because this was the ultimate test. Do you see? Yeah, yeah. It was quite heavy to turn uh, 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 stones into bread. That's heavy. To throw yourself in, uh, down. Uh, that's heavy. But nothing is heavier than this. Bow down and worship me. In other words, here's the deal. Jesus was still going to continue with his ministry. But they will have a secret deal. Secret deal. That listen, continue to minister. Continue to preach. Continue to preach. But you and I have a secret deal. Every now and then you must bow down and worship me. In the absence of the masses, nobody will know it. This is happening in the body of Christ as I speak. Resist temptation. Resist temptation. The Bible tells us that after he resisted and the devil had fled from him, angels came to attend to him. I love that. Angels came to attend to him. That is the vindication of heaven. In other words, these angels were coming to say, well done, well done, well done. And Jesus was provided for. And listen, here is the irony of the story. The enemy is offering you things that belong to you already. This is the irony of the story. 
As a matter of fact, there is nothing that the enemy can offer you that will ever supersede what God has prepared for you. That, that's, that's the Why do you take what is substandard? There is, listen, listen. All of creation and the fullness thereof belong to God. And last time I read scriptures, the Bible says you are co-heirs with Jesus. Whatever is his, is yours. So how come the enemy has business offering you things? I pray that you may have revelation of these things. Think about this. And, and believe me, as much as these things are very simple, but in a moment of madness, you can get tricked. In a moment where you just lose your sobriety, you can get tricked. Think about this. It was Jesus who was the word in the beginning, creating everything. In the beginning was the word. And the word was Jesus. But now how come then later on, the enemy comes to offer the things that were created by the word to the word. He was just hoping for a moment of confusion. And this is what a lot of believers don't understand. A moment, a second, a split second of confusion. You receive what is already yours, but with terms and conditions of selling your soul. And then Jesus will say, what shall it benefit a man to gain the whole world, but to lose his soul? Look. It's already yours. It's already yours. This is your father's ground. All the mountains, the valleys, and the hills, and the rivers, the seas, the moon, and the stars, it is your daddy's. Why do you want to receive it from the enemy? The silver and the gold, everything that is underground, even though, if, even though the enemy might be mining it, but it is your father. In the hands of the enemy, it is stolen. Why do you want stolen things when they are things that are legitimately yours? Resist. Resist in the area of material things. Listen, Barcelona's corner, corner, please. Don't join funny organizations. Don't join secret societies because you are trying to make ends meet. Corner, but wait. And that is why we are praying that the Lord may resource as many people as possible within the body of Christ so that you are not having your fate left in the hands of the enemy. Hallelujah. To be honest with you, if ever you find yourself joining secret societies because of financial problems, honestly, it's your own making. It's your own making. But the Lord has provided you see, never undermine that he is Jehovah Jireh. He is Jehovah, our provider. He is the way maker. Praise the name of Jesus. Just believe that. Just believe that. There's a lot that we can talk about on that issue, but it's very important. Please, uh, we will be tested not only just in the area of sexual, uh, of, of, of financial and material things, even in the area of sexual purity. We'll be tested. Pass the test. Pass the test. Pass the test. That situation in the office where someone is giving you that unhealthy attention. Pass the test. 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 Someone has been giving you an unhealthy attention. At some point, you'll have to say no, no, because you know where it's going to end up. Praise the name of Jesus. Pass the test. And, and listen, listen, pass the test. Even Babu Panza and Babu Koza, they were doing the interview yesterday. A lot was said about business ethics. Pass the test. He test them a brown envelope. He pass them the one. He pass. He pass. He pass. He pass. He pass a little test. God will provide for you. He will make a way. You don't even have to get into bed with anyone for any business deal. Pass the test. The moment we start doing those things, we are actually saying God cannot open doors. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ever ask or imagine. 
Hallelujah. We want people who will be successful without any smell of hell in their success. Niaz when you have made it, we don't want the smell of hell. It's almost like Saul after he has defeated the Amalekites. We see the victory and it's beautiful. But why do we hear the bleating of the sheep in the background? Something does not smell right. We have won the battle. But something doesn't smell right. Hallelujah. Learn these principles. So, in your 40 day experience, I'm sorry to break the news to you. In your 40 day experience, not only will you have an encounter with God, Satan will come too. Never undermine the audacious nature of Satan. He is audacious. He can come in the midst of glory. He will show up. In the midst of heaven, he will show up. No, we are Sunday. We are Sunday. We are Sunday. And that is why you are amazed that Jesus is in a 40 day fast. He's supposed to be repulsive to the enemy. The assumption is. At this point, the, the power is so great, the enemy is supposed to be staying at bay. But the very glory that Jesus was covered in attracted the enemy. As a matter of fact, we have a tanda la baba mbete in kazimulo. Konanjinda aitoli attractive ngabo. So that is why asa complain when we attract troubles. Because we know that the glory upon us is attracting troubles, Bazalwan. He will not leave you alone as long as you are clothed in the glory of God. So in your 40-day experience, not only will you have an encounter with God, you will have an encounter with the devil as well. The 40-day experience that Jesus went through represent a time of testing, trial, and approval. Tested, tried, and approved. May you be tested, tried, and approved. When you have gone through your wilderness experience, may it be said of you, he has been tested, tried, and approved. And this is the material that God wants to release into the world. That's why this had to happen very early in the ministry of Jesus. Early. Matthew chapter 4. Before we talk about many exploits in the kingdom. Before you even go to the cross. Let us test you. Try you. And let us have a time of vindication. Praise the name of Jesus. And, and, and I pray that you pass. Because you see many have dropped the ball beloved. And God is not taking chances. Hallelujah. Please say this with me. I'll be tested. I'll be tried. And I'll be approved by God. Praise the name of Jesus. He says in his word, in this world you will have many troubles. Please, I want you to understand, we, we cannot escape troubles. Pass the test. Pass the test. Pass the test in your relationships. When things seem to be going haywire in your relationships, pass the test. Don't curse. Don't curse. Hallelujah. Pass your marriage test, those of us who are married. When things don't seem to be going right in your marriage, pass the test. Maintain the divine decorum. Maintain in the midst of things you don't understand. When three children are troubling you, your own children troubling you, pass the test. Don't curse them. Pray for them. Stand before the Father. Pass the test. Pass the test even of emotional intelligence. You pass, you pass a little test. Don't be a believer that just snaps and says things they will live to regret. You see, in the wilderness, you are tested in every area of your life. You know, you just explode. No, 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 no. Conquer, conquer your, your emotions. 
You, you must conquer in the area of emotions. Hallelujah. Because a lot of things go wrong when we just burst and we, we say things. Uh, later on, you come, I'm so sorry. It was just in the heat of the moment, you know, I'm so sorry. No, 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 no. Take authority over your temperament. Hallelujah. Now, here is the thing. When you don't participate in this 40-day experience, as I conclude, the problem with this, while Moses is having an encounter with God on the mountaintop, there are activities at the foot of the mountain. We find this in Exodus chapter 32. Moses is having an encounter with God, but there are people who have no encounter. Same nation, same nation, same church, same body of Christ. Others are having an encounter because they honored the invitation. Others are not having an encounter. That is how the golden calf came about. In Exodus 32, verse 1, people are saying, maybe that fellow Moses is dead on the mountain. It's been too long. And then Aaron decided to build a golden calf. He erected a golden calf so that they will worship while trying to figure out what happened to Moses. It was a very sad story, beloved. They were supposed to be basking in the same glory that Moses was basking in. But because they were at the foot of the mountain, not knowing exactly what's going on, they decided to improvise. There is a problem when we don't know the perfect will of God. We come up with alternatives. The golden calf represents an alternative to the perfect will of the Father. We do not know what has happened to that fellow. Let us come up with our own way of worship. These are tendencies that we lean on. The golden calf represents tendencies that we lean on when we don't know the perfect will of God. And there are many golden calves in our lives. Lack of revelation, lack of revelation. You see where there is lack of revelation. When you do not know exactly what's going on in the spirit, the golden calf phenomenon is inevitable. It's a matter of time before you get a golden calf because you do not know what's happening in the spiritual realm. There's a lot we can say about that, but I pray that you do not have alternatives. Can I, can I just tell you, what is the remedy when I don't know what's going on? You wait. You wait. You wait. It is simple. It is simple. When you don't know what's going on, wait. Don't act presumptuously. Don't create a golden calf because you don't figure out exactly what's going on. No, no, no. You wait. We don't build it around. Don't, don't. Don't erect it. Let's wait. Let's wait. It's been a month since Moses is gone and we think maybe he is dead. Let's wait. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. I pray that you wait. If you don't know what to do, just wait. Let, let's move on. Another thing that is represented by the golden calf is false worship. False worship. Notice what they say. They say maybe this fellow Moses is dead. But here's the question. If this fellow is dead on the mountain, why should we change God? Think about that. Why does the death of Moses necessitate a shift to a new God? You know why? It's because we never had a relationship with the God of Moses in the first place. Every believer must graduate from referring to God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. At some point, he is the God of Sponisotamuga. He is personal with me. That is why I'll worship even when Moses is not around. Even when Moses is not, I will worship because I've had an encounter with him. Are you hearing me, beloved? We don't want circumstantial worshipers. Circumstantial worshipers. You must graduate from being a church goer to being an authentic worshiper of God. They that worship God in spirit and in truth. That's the kind that the Father is seeking after. Capital letter S, spirit. 
worshipping God in spirit. Capital letter S. In other words, this is spirit led. Praise the name of Jesus. We have an encounter with the Holy Ghost, so we worship. Praise the name of Jesus. And worshipping him in truth simple means you worship in the purity of heart. And you worship from a position of revelation of truth. The truth has been revealed to you. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free to worship. Hallelujah. You will know the truth. And that truth will liberate you to worship independently. Whether Moses is here or not. That is why I'm saying to you, unfortunately some of you, if we were to take you to the wilderness, that would be the end of your worship experience. When Moses is not around, many of us cannot worship. And I pray that none of you be in that category. Circumstantial worshipers. Circumstantial worshipers. We only worship if. We only worship if. We want people who will worship in spite of. Praise the name of Jesus. You worship even if. But you don't worship if. I hope you catch the difference. You worship even if. You don't worship if. So, even if Moses is not here, we worship in spirit and in truth. Praise the name of Jesus. Here's another thing represented by the golden calf. It is the culture of entertainment. The Bible says in verse 6 of Exodus chapter 32, verse 6, it says, when they worshipped around the calf, they drank ate and they started reveling and that word reveling it means to make a loud noise as in a drunken party make a loud noise as in a drunken party you 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 are you are binging binging alcohol and you make a loud noise as part of the entertainment here yeah? and such was the situation of worshipers entertainment the golden calf in the church represents gratification of self instead of glorifying God you gratify yourself at the expense of glorifying God we are careful on these grounds that is why sometimes beloved let me just stretch you a bit are you ready to be stretched even when we worship God it should not be about how the worship makes you feel. It is not primarily about how it makes you feel. It is about how God feels about it. It is not primarily for you. It is primarily for God. Whenever I see a believer who throws a tantrum just because the songs we sing are not the songs they love. And I know that this person is still stuck in a place where worship is primarily for them. Worship is for God. It is not for us. The only thing is that if you are in the spirit... In his presence, there is fullness of joy. <laughs> At his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. But notice that this presence is not designed for you. <laughs> this thing is for him. But when you come as a spirit man into his presence, you will be joyful. You will be joyful. Hallelujah. You will be joyful. Because deep calls unto deep. There is a divine connection here. But primarily, all honor and all glory goes to him. Praise the name of Jesus. We have a culture of entertainment in the church. If it does not entertain us, it's not going to fly. And nobody ever asks a question, is God pleased with it? Is God pleased with it? It entertains us for sure. It does entertain us. But is God loving it? And I will challenge every worshiper must ask themselves that question. Every worshiper. That is why there are songs we need to discern. Just because the beat is right, just because the rhythm is right, 
But if it does not communicate honor and glory to the Father, you must dump it. Hallelujah. Because I've realized, you know, when you have been around church for a long time, you know there are songs that are very vibey. Very vibey songs. But when you scrutinize them, you say, mm -mm, this does not glorify God. No, this does not bring honor to the Father. Hallelujah. We don't want the culture of entertainment. It says Abba Salon, we don't want the culture of entertainment. But you can rest assured, in his presence there is fullness of joy. At his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. But it will not be carnal entertainment. This is another thing that is represented by the golden calf as we close. The golden calf represents blind following. Blind following. To follow blindly. Here's a quick lesson for you. Just because Aaron is doing it, it doesn't make it right. Just because the progenitor of priesthood just because the ancestor of all priests in the nation is leading it, it doesn't make it right. Avoid a situation where there is copy and paste. You see a powerful man of God doing it, and then you copy and paste. No, 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 no. If you have been to the mountain, you must know the truth for yourself. It doesn't matter whether a powerful man or woman of God is doing it. We are not going to play copy and paste. There is a simple thing that I, 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 I once asked myself, you know. You know this thing where of, of, of uh, and, and I'm sure we, 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 we know it. We know, I'm sure you've seen this. I'm sure it's, it's quite common. When you preach, people throw money at you. you have, seen, have you seen that? You are ministering the word. Someone comes to, do, do you have any money? You know, someone comes with money. You know, and, 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 and the man of God is ministering. He's ministering. And, 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 and they, they, thanks, ma. Thanks. You know, and, and here's the thing. Yeah, hallelujah. And they throw it. They throw it. And, and the man of God is walking on it. Praise God. Hallelujah. And then, and then while the man of God is preaching, someone is standing. Waiting for another revelation. And the man of God is standing looking at this man. You know, and, 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 and here is the thing. I ask one time, where does this come from? Where does this come from? Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. <laughs> you know, I ask, where does this come from? This is what you are doing. You are now pushing this man or woman of God to say what your itching ears want to hear. If you don't love the truth, you stop throwing money. But if the message tickles your fancy, then you start throwing money. That's carnal. I don't care who's doing it. I don't care which powerful man or woman of God started it. It is carnal. And there is no way you can say to people, repent, you brood of vipers. And they will throw money at you. No. So this whole thing is controlling the message. How often, <laughs> tell me if it has ever happened, when someone said repent or perish and money kept coming, money kept coming. They are controlling the message. How often does it come when someone says, stop what you're doing? It is displeasing to God. To never come. To never come. But the moment you say, I see a multimillionaire. Oh, it's coming. It's coming. In Jesus' mighty name, before this year is over. Oh, I see that hotel. It is yours, child of God. It will keep coming. There are many golden calves in the house of the Lord. And I pray that we be aware of them. It's not copy and paste. Descend. Descend. Let's stand on our feet. This 40-day experience is going to call for you to learn things you have never learned before. You will learn new ways. 
It's not exactly new ways. They've always been there. But your eyes were not open to them. You will learn true worship. You will learn things that were never taught to you before because of the modern culture, postmodernism culture. But I pray that your heart may absorb the things of the spirit. They may be unfamiliar because of apostasy, because of falsehood. But I pray that you embrace them in Jesus' mighty name. The last thing that is represented by the golden calf is lack of revelation about finances. Lack of revelation about finances. We don't have a revelation of the primary purpose of silver and gold. When we don't have a revelation of the primary purpose of silver and gold, we will build a golden calf. It will be built. Let me just remind you, Exodus chapter 12, verses 35 and 36. The Bible tells us that uh, when they went to Egyptian homes to ask for silver and gold, God favorably disposed the hearts of the Egyptians towards them. So that when you will come knocking as a Hebrew person, the Egyptian people will just give you silver. They will not even know what they're doing. They will just give you silver and gold. They will give you precious stones and they will even give you expensive linen supernaturally orchestrated by God that was wealth transfer wealth transfer and then verse 35 verse, verse 36 in Exodus chapter 12 and the Bible says they plundered the Egyptians just before they left God is going to do it before we go home praise God God will do it before we go home they plundered the Egyptians but you fast forward you get to chapter 24 of Exodus Moses goes up to the mountain spend time in God's presence, he receives instruction on what to do with the silver and gold. Track with me. He's getting instructions on what to do with silver and gold. But they did not have the same instruction. At the foot of the mountain, they take the silver, they take the gold, and they start erecting the golden calf. Where there is lack of revelation about money, Money will be abused. Money will be misappropriated. Money will go to places it's not supposed to go to. And I pray in Jesus' mighty name that you may spend your 40-day experience because you see, we are on the verge of wealth transfer. We're on the verge of wealth transfer. Do yourself a favor. Ask God, Father, what do you want me to do with silver and gold? What do you want me to do with all this money when you give me promotion? Father, if my investments supernaturally get inflated, what do I do with the proceeds of God? What do I do? May you get revelation, get revelation, get revelation. And I will quickly submit to you that primarily that silver and gold is meant for the house of the Lord. It is meant for advancement of the kingdom. As you advance the kingdom of God, you can rest assured that God will fulfill the desires of your heart. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these other things will be added to you. I want to say this as I said it yesterday. God knows the things you love. He knows the desires of your heart. But he says, delight yourself in me first. In the book of Haggai chapter 2, if you read verses 8 and 9, Haggai chapter 2 verses 8 and 9, the Bible says the glory of the latter house will be greater than that of the former. And then God says, silver is mine, gold is mine. For the glory of the latter house to be greater than that of the former, it will take silver and gold. Silver and gold. The gospel to be preached, silver and gold. Disciples to be made, silver and gold. Those youth camps, silver and gold. Those children's church training programs, silver and gold. Church planting, silver and gold. Missions in rural places and villages, silver and gold. The glory of the latter house will be greater than that of the former. God says silver is mine, gold is mine. That's the primary purpose. That's the primary purpose. Everything else is secondary. The car you want is secondary. 
The mansion you want to build is secondary. And believe me, I'm not saying it's not going to come. It will come. But first things first. That's the revelation people at the foot of the mountain did not have. First things first. Lift up your hands. Father, in Jesus' mighty name. We pray for this mountaintop experience. We pray for our 40 day experience so that we may understand the mysteries of the kingdom. So that we may understand your will, O oh God. Your will be done in our generation as it is done in heaven. Your will be done in our lifetime as it is done in heaven. Your will be done at Christ Centered Missions Church as it is done in heaven. Your will be done in the body of Christ as it is done in heaven. Your will be done in Queensbury as it is done in heaven you will be done in our families as it is done in heaven you will be done in our businesses as it is done in heaven you will be done in our vocations as it is done in heaven you will be done in our office spaces in our streets wherever we are as it is done in heaven we submit under your authority O oh God we don't want to build golden calves father we want to do your will and do it accurately. In Jesus' mighty name, we are after accurate execution of your will. We are after accurate implementation of your purposes, O oh God. In Jesus' mighty name, your will be done in our ministries as it is done in heaven. In Jesus' mighty name, be exalted, be glorified.